Welcome to Pixel Tunes Radio, a podcast where we have fun talking about video games and video game music. I am Mike. And I am Ed. And you are joining us on our 31st episode. 31st, man. 31st. Midlife crisis time. <laughs> you know I'm turning 32 next week. Yeah, well, I'm already 36. So, <laughs> bear on you. <laughs> <laughs> you say that so bitterly. <laughs> Just like, yeah, well, you'll never be 36. Yes, I'll always be older than you. <laughs> This episode, we are doing same song, different system. Yeah, we're going to change up the format, probably the most we've ever changed yeah, before. I agree. So what we're going to do is play several of the same songs from different systems. Right. So different consoles, arcades, ooh, home, right. home computers. We're stipulating that they have to be the same song. So, yeah. in other words, not like a version of Vampire Killer from Castlevania 2 and Super Castlevania 4 because they're essentially different games. We're talking about ports or remakes of the same game, right. same tune, same place in the game. So, should be a lot of fun. Yeah, I think so. It better. I don't know what yeah. else I'd be doing here if it wasn't fun. I mean, we've got we've got some games with tunes that go back as far as the PC88 and go with, you know into like PSP. So this should be really cool to check them out and kind of yeah. compare and contrast the games themselves and also the music that they come with. We're going to talk about those songs in just a bit, but uh, first I figure we'll just kind of catch everybody up to what's been going on. So what's been going on with you? I am fresh out of PAX East. Yeah. How how was it? Did you have a good time? It was pretty good. It was yeah. really really packed. It was my first one. Now, that's your first PAX or my your first, first convention? My first PAX East and also my first video game convention. Oh, snap. So I have popped my video game convention cherry. Yes. Yes. And you want more. Uh, I do. It was a lot of fun. The AAA booths were extremely packed and you had to wait in oh, line I for a imagine. long time. Yeah. I only went for one day. I only went on Saturday. And because we had to drop my kiddo out, my the youngest kiddo at my parents' house, we, yeah. kind of, we didn't get there until like noon. Okay. Because it's a long drive from Connecticut to Boston. Oh, so yeah. we didn't have a lot of time to spend, so I didn't really have time to spare to, to wait in the lines to play a lot of the more popular games. So I kind of hung out in the Indie Mega booth a lot and got to see a lot of really cool games that are coming out for you know, iOS and Steam and PC and all that. And it was a lot of really cool stuff. Got to check out uh, Hotline Miami 2 before it came out. Cool. And then, you know, even though I wasn't able to play a lot of the more AAA games, I was able to, like, check out, you know, stand to the side and watch people playing Halo 5 and Splatoon for the Wii U. Oh, cool. So it was a lot of really cool stuff that I got to check out. And, of course, you get swag, and I met the guys from Cards Against Humanity. So it's a, it a lot of fun. How was Splatoon? Dude, Splatoon your... looks awesome. It does? Yeah. It plays really well. Okay. And it's not like, you know, Nintendo. They, yeah. they don't do violence. Right. So you're competing for space and covering the area in your color will enable you to transform into like a, a squid and, and move through that area faster. So yeah. it's it's a gameplay benefit plus it's how you win the game. So yeah. um, from from what I saw, the people playing it were, were loving it and having a really good time. So I'm excited for, for the release. Yeah, I'm, I'm still on the fence about it. I'm hoping they come out with a demo because I think there are a lot of people that are on the fence and I myself was on the fence until yeah. I actually saw it and saw people having a blast playing cool. it. Now cool. it looks like, you know, that's not even my kind of game. Yeah. And uh, it kind of changed my mind. So what's going on with you, man? Oh, I've been struggling with uh, this latest episode of Dude, You Haven't Played oh, This Game. Yeah. Uh, for those of you who don't follow me on Twitter or Facebook, uh, I lost my secondary hard drive, which Extreme had drive, yeah. all of the Metroid Other M gameplay footage. So, episode shot, all the live action sh uh, stuff is shot, all the uh, vocal audio recording stuff is done. Up until this happened, I had about 35 to 40% of the review done. It was going to come out this past Saturday. And lo and behold, I lost all the gameplay footage and uh, basically had to start re-recording it on my main hard drive. The secondary hard drive was not able to be repaired. Super bummer. Yeah, but it happens. So I'm really hoping that I can release it this week because- As of this recording. As of this recording, meaning you will probably already have seen it. Cross your fingers. You, if you haven't, go check it out. What's our first track? So our first track is going to be one of Sega's, I'm going to say one of their most iconic songs yeah. ever. Even in Sonic Racing Extreme or Tron Sonic Racing Transformed, like they, they used this track as the song that is kind of like the Sega stage, Sound. which defines their, yeah. their, their, their branding. So this is the 
main level theme from Space Harrier from Hiroshi Kawaguchi, and we're gonna play the original song, which is from the arcade version, and also appears in the 32X version in the same format. And then we're gonna follow that up with a version from the Master System, and then move into the more recent version from the Sega Ages compilation, which was on the PS2. So we're gonna, this is how we're gonna change the format up a little bit. We're gonna talk about all the songs after the break. So let's give a listen to Hiroshi Kawaguchi's Space Harrier theme from the arcade version, right now. Hiroshi Kawaguchi's Space Harrier main theme on the arcade that came out in 1985. This next track that we're going to listen to is the Master System version, which came out in 1987, and it was arranged by Tokohiko Uabo.
is the Master System version of Space Harrier's main theme. This next version is from the PS2 Sega Ages version, and we could not find a composer for this unfortunately, but this version came out in 2005. So welcome back. That was Space Harrier's main theme on the arcade, Master System, and PS2. Yeah, I guess you could also say it was 32X. We uh, yeah. we compared the 32X version to the arcade version, and we were really surprised to see how accurately they mimicked the arcade version on the 32X, even though they use different sound hardware. So I was pretty impressed how they were able to, even even the tones of the FM synth yeah. were like identical. So no, that's what I, that's what really I said. Cool. It was funny because I was like, yeah, the Space Area arcade theme is the same as the 32X. And you were like, no. <laughs> Impossible. Impossible. And then you listened to it and you were like, oh my God, it is. Yeah, it's crazy. There's also a Sharp X68000 version of the song too, which is pretty good. And yeah. it's actually very close to the arcade as well. Right, it's one of the reasons why we didn't play it because yeah. there wasn't too much to compare it to as far right. as one to the other. 
So as far as the arcade version, there's uh, a nice hidden synth in the background. Uh, it kind of adds a layer of like this spacey sound to it underneath in the main lead. So it's kind of a nice partner to Yeah, that. well the, the main synth has a very tight vibrato. Yeah. So having a more solid synth underneath it just kind of gives that little yeah. have to make it sound a little more thick. Right, so. right. Yeah, that main theme of it, the nice, the main synth is just so uplifting. Yeah, and, and it completely and... loses that on the second oh, yeah. system version. Yeah, it does. <laughs> the main synth is, I would say, very disco era as far as the sound. Yeah. It's just oh, got yeah. this very, like, boop, 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 boop. It's like, got a I can picture that sound. Yeah, Dancing Queen, exactly. Uh, bass line's pretty simple. I mean, it keeps a nice beat with the drums, but it's pretty pretty much like a two note, like do 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 do, you know. So the drums are pretty simple as well, but uh, it's just a really good overall great song, and I really think that the lead synth is the star of this song. It's, Absolutely, it's definitely that main synth that that keeps it going, and then it kind of moves into this like Survivor Eye of the Tiger sort of like you can do it. Side of sort of sound. It kind of amazes me that this is only Kawaguchi's second video game composition right. ever. You know, he started off with Hang On uh, in the same year, which was actually one of my favorite arcade games when I was a kid because I loved sitting on that huge red motorcycle and mm -hmm. leaning back and forth. He created the melodies for Outrun as well, which, you know, those have been remixed and arranged many, many times over right. the years. Fantasy Zone. Yeah. Went on to do Power Drift, which is probably my second favorite arcade soundtrack <laughs> of all time. So he's got some excellent stuff under his belt. You know, followed it up he, with uh, Bayonetta in 2009. He did the soundtrack right. for that. Yeah. And then Protect Me Night 2, which came out last year only in Japan. That was the sequel to the game we played on the Yuzo Koshiro mm -hmm. episode, Protect Me Night. And uh, so he worked with Yuzo Koshiro directly on that. It was fun. Yeah. I mean, it, it was like a nice throwback to like Master System era type game. Right. And yeah. it would be totally cool to see Kawaguchi go back to the 16-bit, 8-bit yeah. style song composition for that for that game. So that's, cross your fingers, hope it comes out. That's not his only game, too, that, that didn't come out here. Rent a Hero uh, number one didn't come out here either. Yeah, that, that actually was, just uh, got an English translation for yeah. the Genesis version. Yeah. Uh, well, the Xbox, I think there was an, it was an Xbox. I'm talking about a ROM patch. Oh. You can actually take the Genesis version game and, and there's a patch you can apply to it to put it in English. Well, there was a game called Rent a Hero that came out, but there was also another game that only came out in Japan for Xbox only, uh, and actually Dreamcast, and it was called Rent a Hero Number no. 1. Uh -oh. And that was actually a remake of the original Mega Drive game. So, gotcha. yeah, yeah, yeah. So Kawaguchi did the remake version, but not yeah. the original no, he version? No, he did both. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. That's a good way so, to check out his music then. Yeah, yeah. So, and he did Sword of Vermilion, which I have not played. You know when you go in the video store, which R.I.P. video stores, and you used to go through and you'd always see that one movie and you'd always notice the cover, like yeah. the cover was really noticeable? I have that feeling about Sword of Vermilion. Never played it, <laughs> but always see the cover and I'm like, what is that? That's funny. Yeah, yeah. So, the Master System version was arranged by Tokuhiko Uwabu, and I think he did the best he could with the Master System hardware. I think he did a good job. The... Master System had a <laughs> FM synth built into it in yeah. Japan, but they only used the the PSG in America. So this is the, the PSG only version. Right. And you know it's it's good. It's yeah. a, it's a direct translation of the original song, but I, I do think it loses a lot when it doesn't have those textured FM synths in it. He mainly dealt with porting stuff over to the Master System as far as like audio wise. But he also composed the music for the first Fantasy Star titles. He's got credits on Arnold Palmer Tournament Golf, Sorcerian, Columns. Uh, he's done a lot of different stuff in a pretty varied career. So. He also went solo That's writing right. the soundtrack for Space Harrier 2, which right. was released on the Genesis. That had a great soundtrack, and yeah. that was a fun game. That was a really good version of the Space Harrier. I mean, like, for a sequel, it was it was a nice change uh, while keeping the original, you know, kind of fresh and, yeah. and different. Getting back to the Master System version real quick, um, the drums are terrible. I mean, oh, was, yeah. uh, well, really bad. And, and that background synth is still kind of there, but the song gets better as it goes later on, right, yeah. past that introduction, but that introduction is very muddy. Something just sounds a little off. Yeah. The PS2 version is, uh, I mean, the game is a straight up remake of the original Space Harrier, not like remake, like the recent 3D classic version. By the way, if you haven't checked those out, the, all those games that M2 worked on, really amazing. Yeah. Oh my God, yes. I downloaded Streets of Rage, the first one, 
And, I mean, it's like a completely different game. I have difficulty seeing how those games could translate into 3D, but if you say they're good... They're they really cool. You'll have to try it yeah, out. I'll let you that try it out. So. Yeah, no, they're pretty cheap. In Japan, they actually came out with a compilation of all the games, which is really unfortunate because I would have bought that compilation. Oh, was, it it had, was it a retail yeah, release? Yeah, it was a retail release, wow. which had a compilation of all the 3D classics that they came out with. And they Stupid region lock 3DS. Honestly. So this PS2 version <laughs> is is pretty much happy hardcore music. You know, the music's like DDR, it's very happy, very bouncy. I really like it. I mean, it's got the lead synths are kind of a weird, strange mix with like synth trumpets that are kind of hovering over like fast techno beats, which makes it kind of sound strange. And they took out the whole Rocky inspired sounding music in the middle and added this like breakdown that kind of rolls right back into the main theme, which yeah. is, I don't know. I, it just I, sounds like, generic German Euro techno. It, yeah. It kind of did away with the unique sound that the original version had. I think the original version is just very 80s mm -hmm. sounding and very like early 80s, late 70s disco inspired music. And then they kind of add in this Eye of the Tiger stuff that kind of, it fits but I think with this PS2 version, they kind of knew like, there is no way we're gonna be able to fit the Eye of the Tiger part in. <laughs> we're gonna have to like, come up with something that's a little bit different sounding and makes the song unique enough that it can roll back into the main theme. And I think they did a really good job with what they came up with. Um, and kind of brings the song closer into the 90s and the 2000s. So I think, I don't know, who knows, maybe in 10 years we'll get like, a, 2010 version with a of, dubstep sound. Yeah, a dubstep, or or maybe it'll be like you know soft guitar. You know, like all those TV shows that have like the stupid banjos. Every commercial now has like a ding 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 ding, ding like a banjo. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, every like, commercial yeah. now has that. So maybe we'll get that. Yeah, for the next. Or the version. hippie chick playing the yeah, yeah, guitar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here is Space Harrier. It's a great game, you know. Yeah, no, terrible. <laughs> Anyways, let's move on to the gameplay. Yeah, yeah. So this game is kind of like a behind the camera flying game. The camera's behind you, this main character, so you're basically watching him fly around. And you can move all around the screen and very similar to Star Fox, Fox in the sense that uh, <laughs> you can fly around and it's, it's I, I guess you could call it on rails because you can't turn around, right? Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I, I reserve the, the term on rails for something where you're wandering through an environment and, and it's making corners and turns for you. And this is just right. kind of like a hallway, you know? It's right, just one right. straight level. Yeah. So it's an auto-scrolling third-person shooter, right. basically. And you're just going around, you've got this giant cannon that you're just blasting stuff with. You can blow up trees, you can blow up, blow up bushes, and you know, you blow up the clouds. clouds. And you know, the main thing is destroying the enemies, so getting to the end of the game. And it definitely is a cool arcade experience. If you've ever played it, like if you've ever gone to Fun Spot, uh, they have one there. And when it is up and running, it's a lot of fun to play on the arcade. Yeah, it's also fully playable in MAME too, so you can oh, yeah. play it at home. True. And if you have a 32X, you can play the 32X version or the Saturn version, both of which are pretty much arcade perfect. Yeah, but who has or a 32X? Come I on. do. I have two 32Xs. Well, you should not have two. Well, what if I want to? No. Then I'll have a 64 double X. <laughs> it's like better That's, than a Jaguar. It's a 64XX? Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the 64XX. I should do that. I should daisy chain them and see if I get oh, extra power. Oh, God. It'll be like that picture that is so infamous on the internet with the uh, Game Genie... The Tower mind, of Genesis. The Tower of Sega. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So what do you think about the Master System version? The Master System version is basically like Space Harrier threw up. <laughs> uh, yeah, threw up. Yeah, I don't know. I think they, they tried to throw a game on the Master System that the Master System just couldn't handle. Very well. The graphics are really choppy yeah. and very blocky. The draw distance is really bad. I like, played I played up into the first boss, okay. the dragon. Yeah. I know he has a name, but I don't remember what it is. They're all weird names. Literally, I had to check to make sure that the game wasn't corrupt because mm -hmm. the graphics were so uh, garbled yeah. and just moving kind of erratically. Like I couldn't tell what the dragon's tail was and what the head was and where I should be shooting. Mm. It just got completely awful at that point. And I kind of stopped playing after the second level because yeah. it, it just started giving me a headache. It mm. wasn't wasn't fun to play at all. So, I mean, I guess if it was your first version of Space Harrier and that was your definitive version, you could probably find it fun. But I liked it. At this point, you know, 
with the arcade perfect versions readily available for True. home use, stick with the arcade version and don't don't worry about the Master System version. Yeah, it's fun to, to listen to the the Master System soundtrack though and just hear how it's done with a with a PSG you know yeah. wavetable synth. But other than that, I don't see much use in the SMS version anymore. I like the uh, the PS2 version, the Sega Ages version. I mean, I think that. It's nice to sometimes get updated versions of those old arcade games. You yeah. know, it kind of puts a fresh coat of paint on them. So that, that's the only version that I haven't played. So is yeah. it is it just like they updated the sprites? It's got smoother scaling and, and that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, or is it polygonal or it's it's more like it's 3D. It's it's more updated. It feels more modernized. Cool. I'll have to check that out. Yeah, it's pretty neat. So all those of the game I haven't played. All those Sega Ages games are, are like that. Like uh, the Golden Axe was good. Golden they Axe did a good. version of Virtual Racing. Yeah, which was pretty Alien uh, Syndrome. Yeah, which that game just it's gotten so many butchered ports. Yeah that the Master System version is probably one of the better versions. The NES version is pretty low standard, yeah. uh, if I recall. Well, you know, it's the arcade version. Yeah. Speaking of Nintendo versions, 3D World Runner was like a direct rip-off right. of this Space Harrier totally for the NES. totally a rip-off. Different yeah, soundtrack, but uh, you know, the gameplay was, I, I'd say comparing the Master System and the NES, 3D World Runner versus Space Harrier, you're I'd probably better off going with 3D World Runner. 3D World Runner, yeah, plus you had the 3D glasses. Yeah, they actually made a 3D glasses compatible version of Space Harrier for right, the Japanese, for the, for the Mark, Master Mark III. Right, yeah. right, right, that's true. So, I say we get into our next game. Yeah? What is our next game? Our then? next game is Gradius Three, And there's actually a subtitle to this game, which I did not know up until recently. And I've owned the game for like three decades. Um, so How dare you? The, the official full title is called Gradius Three: From Legend to Myth. That was never like displayed anywhere on the Super Nintendo version. Yeah. But it's everywhere you go, like to look up the game, the subtitle's always there. It's really interesting. Yeah. So, anyways, we're gonna play a track from the Easter Stone stage, and we're gonna compare the arcade version to the SNES version. Here we go. was the Easter Stone stage from the arcade version of Gradius 3 from Junihichiro Kaneda, Seiichi Fukami, Miki Hagashino, Keizo Nakamura, and Mutsuhiko Izumi. This is the SNES version of the same stage.
was the SNES version of Easter Stone from Gradius 3, arranged by Kazuki Maruaka, Kazuhiko Uehara, Harumi Ueko, and Yuki Morimoto. And I don't know, I'm on the fence between which version I prefer more. They each have their own strengths, you know? What, what did you think about them? I uh, really like those drums on the arcade version. Aren't they sweet? Yeah, yeah. It's like the, full just... timpani. Yeah. Blaring orchestra stuff. You just, I mean, if you listen to the two songs like back to back, you cannot mistake that the arcade version is just sounds more full, and the Super Nintendo version is just like a lot flatter sound. Yeah, yeah. I like the SNES version. Well, I guess a because this was this was like the third or fourth release that ever came out for the Super Nintendo, and I owned it since then. So I mean, this game has been just one of my favorite games since since I was a wee lass. Lad. I was a lad. You were a wee lad. I was a little girl back in the yeah. 90s. Yeah. I remember when I was a Don't little girl. Don't let the full beard fool you. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Um, anyways. Uh, but it's the version that I grew up with. So it's the version that when I hear it, you know, when I hear the arcade version, I'm like, no, it should really sound like this. Right. Which is the SNES version. But the more I listen to the arcade version, the more I kind of get impressed with it, I guess. I guess the Super Nintendo version sounds a little more sci-fi once those kind of like Star yeah. Trek synths True. kick in. And the arcade version has more of those traditional orchestra hits that Konami like loved oh, to use yeah. on the Ninja Turtle games, yep. Sunset Riders, synth hits, yeah. and all that. The yeah. arcade version actually used a YM2151, same chip that's in the X68000. Okay. But then they coupled it with the K007232, which is the Konami SCC chip, which is basically their PSG chip, mm -hmm. all controlled by a Z80 uh, sound CPU. So you have kind of those thick FM synth sounds. Their PSG chip sampled sounds at an incredibly high rate, so you get these really full, vibrant voices and instrumentation, so it kind of blends them both together really mm. well. Konami's arcade sounds were always phenomenal. Oh, they were always phenomenal. Great. So yeah, the Super Nintendo obviously used the, the SPC 700, so all the music was sampled and, or made of samples. It was really the first game that I think I ever heard that actually used like cymbal crashes and sampled, right. sampled percussion like that, which was kind of cool. And the slap bass for, in the Super Nintendo just, I don't know, I mean it's just, in other games I would appreciate it I think a lot more, like you hear a slap bass in like Super Castlevania 4 or whatever in certain levels like in the sixth level I'm gonna say. Yeah, but when you have more of a jazz fusion sound it kind of fits yeah. a little bit. Better. Agreed, agreed. That, that's I think my, my point is when you've got a song that, that has that slap bass in it that fits the mood, it sounds a lot better, but here it just sounds off. It just doesn't sound like it should, like it belongs. Yeah, I can I can see where you're coming from. I, I don't yeah. I don't think that as much because obviously that's the way I grew up hearing the sure, song. Sure, so sure, It fits for me. Yeah. Um, but I can understand how somebody would come in and listen to both versions and say, oh yeah, the arcade version definitely sounds more like a uh, bombastic shooter yeah. stage would be. Well, I mean, I, it's not that I hadn't played Gradius 3. I played it when I was a kid. It's just I wasn't that invested into shooters. I liked mm. playing as people. And so playing as ships, I was kind of like, eh. The only game that I really... It's a person, man. His name is Vic Viper. <laughs> That's how he does his taxes. <laughs> Vic Q Viper. Um, I, I always just... Occupation... Uh, Shooter. Action facing shooter. <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't think there were a lot of... I know I go back to UN Squadron a lot, but I think the reason why I appreciated UN Squadron more be, was because you get to meet your pilots before you even get in the ship. Yeah, I guess I can see that. So you pick your pilots and then you're like, oh, okay, I know who I'm playing as I know who's in that ship. And so that's why I, I always go back to UN Squadron when I, when I talk about shooters. And it wasn't until recently that I kind of got out of that mentality because you know when I started hanging out with you you were such a big shooter fan and you kind of hit such a bad influence to, yeah you're such a bad influence on me <laughs> so there were a lot of shooters that I've discovered recently but Gradius 3 was always one of those games that like I always preferred Gradius to R-Type I don't know why it's not that R-Type was bad I agree I mean Gradius is a little more flashy yeah yeah I and agree. it's a little more user friendly yeah I think you have more wide open spaces to fly around in yeah whereas our type gets really tight, yeah. you know, and you really have to know where you're going when multiple paths pick yeah. up. So, Gradius, I, I think, also has better weapons too. Yeah, I think you get, I think you get a better choice. When you're fully powered up, you can spread a yeah. shot throughout the entire screen. That's kind of the problem, though. Like we've been doing this thing where we gather a bunch of our friends together and we are just like, "Hey, what games can we plow through? <laughs> like, just totally be and decimate." And our friend Justin was fairly confident that he could get through Gradius three. And the more we got to playing, I think he was better at it probably when he was a kid. 
and and when he played it recently, he was kind of like, oh man, this is really hard. Yeah, his mistake actually, the SNES version of Gradius 3 is really difficult. It is really hard. I have never been able to beat the game without help, even yeah. playing it on easy. Right. And Justin accidentally picked normal instead yeah. of yeah. easy. <laughs> And so you know he he got he got to he got he got beyond, really far because he got beyond the Easter Island stage, which yeah. is the stage that we just played the song from. But it was like I think we did put in a code for thirty guys, yeah. thirty guy code. Yeah. And he had to he had to run through all thirty guys because yeah. once you die, you lose all of your power ups. Right. And you're you're basically like completely you're nerfed. There's yeah. nothing you can do. Yeah. That's a big problem uh, with this game. It's very similar to the Little Mermaid on the Nintendo. It's basically like once you become super powerful. There, nothing can stop you, but if you do die, forget it. Right. Like, you cannot get through the game. Yeah. It's impossible. The, um, the Easter Island head stage in the arcade versus the SNES does have a few, like, major differences. I noticed that mm. in the arcade version, these huge Easter Island heads will fly at you and drop the heads, like, onto the platforms okay. instead of them just being there on the SNES oh, version. Okay. But the problem is they, they fly at you and there's, like, there's two really close together. They're kind of flying in a vertical formation, and you can't destroy them. Like right. I was fully powered up when I was getting through them. Oh, and you can't. And I was them. shooting the heck out of them. And oh, they would wow. not die. They probably aren't, aren't programmed to die then. And you can't fly between them. Okay. So they would just come at you, and if you're stuck between two platforms, you're you're, you're, you're done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the arcade version kind of like came up with ways to eat your quarters, which huh. obviously they were designed to do, but it was kind of some cheap stuff. That's a bummer, dude. Yeah, and you know, the arcade version definitely has more differences, I guess, as you get farther through the levels. The cool thing about it is there's a lot of more clear vocal samples in the arcade because of that extra SCC chip they had. Are there vocals in Gradius 3? Yeah, because like when, when, when you get to a boss, it's like, destroy the eye and <laughs> destroy the shoulder. Or oh, what was it? The big flaming dragon in the flames there is like, destroy the chest. And its chest is like big and glowing. Right. That, that was another boss that wasn't even in. Because I think in the Super Nintendo version, you just get to those big, long, flamey dragons, whereas or actually in the arcade version, there's a giant, like, full-size dragon that you have to beat before you get to the, the flamey worm dragons. Gradius 3 had some really cool bosses, too. Yeah, oh yeah, tons of them. Yeah. Everything from, like, giant spaceships to giant, bulbous, organic enemy things. Giant it's crabs. Giant enemy crabs? Giant enemy crabs. Giant enemy crabs. Realism at its finest. Attack its weak spot for massive damage. <laughs> oh boy. All right. Anyways, so that was Gradius 3. Fun game. One of Konami's finest. Great soundtrack. I really enjoyed it. There are uh, versions available on the PSP and PS2 as well, so you can definitely check those out. Yeah, the PSP is just like a compilation. If I recall, it's like yeah. Gradius one through five. No, for all five, that's yeah, probably yeah. worth it. No, it's totally a good to deal. Dig the and it's cheap too. Five inches of dust that's kicked onto my PSP at this yeah, point. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the PSP had some really great games. It did, and I've played through all of them, and all nothing, of them. nothing else is available, so it just kind of sits in my drawer. <laughs> Have you checked out Crimson Gem Saga? I want to check that out. Uh, no, I haven't. It's an RPG, but it's that's probably why I haven't checked it out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Anyways, speaking of RPGs, let's get to our next track. Yeez 3 is our next game. It's it, The full title is Yeez 3 Wanderers from Yeez. Correct. Yes. And this is a track called Be Careful. Why should you be careful? Well, because this is the first dungeon that you go into. This is true. It is. And you are super, super low powered. Oh my god, enemies, yes. Like you touch two enemies and you're dead. Many people haven't even made it through this dungeon before quitting. But anyways, we'll talk about that after the break. I We're gonna start off. What? I think that's me. <laughs> We're gonna start off with the PC88 version, segue into the X68000 version, play the SNES version, and then treat you guys to our special Oath and Felgana version. Enjoy.
that was Yee's Three Wonders from Yee's song called Be Careful from the original composer Mieko Ishikawa on the PC-88. Next up is Masaki Kawai's arranged version from the X-68000. version. Coming up next is the SNES version arranged by Michiharu Hasuya, Masaki Hirata, and Osamu Kusai. Thank you. 
that was the SNES version. This is the version from Oath in Felgana, arranged by Yukohiro Jindo. like Bionic Commando Rearmed and Ease the Oath in Felgana selling extremely well, it seems that Remake Fever has caught the world by storm. Everyone's playing modern versions of their old classic favorites. But what if? What if you could reverse that? Reverse it? You heard me. Reverse it. Here at Backward Studios, we demake the modern games you love to play. Enjoy this 8-bit version of Just Cause 2. Uh, this is just Bionic Commando with a different title screen. Get ready for scares with our 16-bit demake of Amnesia, The Dark Descent. And this is the Super NES version of Clock Tower. What are you trying to- And our biggest seller, Call of Duty Classic. <laughs> Dude, this is just Ikari Warriors. I can't even- Okay, look. Sometimes modern games just end up looking like the games you know and love when they're demade. We can't help that. Do you even program these versions? Are you just selling illegal ROMs for profit? Oh, uh, uh, no, no. <laughs> so visit us at totallynotillegalroms.com and order your demakes today. Use only as prescribed. And that was the arranged version from Yee's Oath in Felgana from Yukihiro Jindo, and that was out on the PSP and PC in Japan and some of the more modern systems. Right. So they definitely took the 
music and a whole different direction on that. Yeah, I mean the whole game kind of as well. Uh, it kind of fit the more modern these games that are kind of like Zelda overhead st uh, style. Right. So Oath and Falgana was of course a remake of Wanderers from Yeez or Yeez 3. Mm -hmm. And Yeez 3 first came out on the PC-88 and then kind of made its way to multiple different systems. One of the versions we didn't play was the Genesis version, which you were talking about it. It's kind of a mix in between what the PC-88 and the Sharp X68000 version. Yeah. Musically, yeah. at least. Yeah. yeah. You know, the PC-88 version was the original version. Mieko Ishikawa worked on it, and some say that Yuzo Koshiro also had a hand in writing that. Oh, really? But we, we well, don't, he's well, credited he on, on the game. He worked on the first two games. Right, exactly. Right. And so people think that he's credited, or at least I think he's credited, because The Boy's Got Wings is directly based on the theme of Edo. Right. So I don't know if he's just credited for the inspiration for that song, or Probably. if he actually helped Ishikawa work on Ease 3, but regardless, it's a fantastic soundtrack. Oh, yeah. The arranged version from Masaki Kawai is kind of similar to the PC-88 version, but the 2151 just had a fuller, more robust FM synth capability, so the, the instrumentation, I think, is better, as well as, obviously, those, those beefy drums that I love to talk <laughs> about on the 68000, so that really adds a lot to the song as well. And now the SNES version is, I, I guess it's kind of controversial because it's 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 the version I grew up with. And, yeah, and you too, same here. Right? Yeah. So obviously it's the version that's like the definitive version for me because it's it's what I remember as a kid. But every time I go to like a YouTube video that has the SNES version of the soundtrack, everybody's like, the SNES version sucks, the Genesis version is so much better. And I'm like, I don't know. Yeah. I can't. I love the fact that the SNES version is completely unique. It uses a sound font that you don't. I haven't really heard this this particular set of sounds in any other SNES game. It sounds really unique to me. Yeah. And I, I don't know. It just puts it kind of a less aggressive and more uh, kind of a slick feel, I guess, to the songs with a lot of really complex hi-hats and stuff that you really couldn't do with an FM synth. I don't know, I, th I think it just brought out things in the songs that you didn't get on the FM synth version. Yeah, the PC-88 version, I just think is mush. I just think the whole thing, all the synths sound mushy. Yeah, it's a very early yeah. FM synth, so they... And the X68000 version is better. I, I Just for me, the Super Nintendo version is the best version. Yeah. Uh, I really like how somehow they transition a bass line as the lead synth. That just is unheard of <laughs> to hear in a in a video game. Yeah. So that hearing that main bass line as the lead synth, it's just like what? And then it kind of fades into the background, and the and the other synths kind of come up from behind. And and so I think that's where the big problem is: is people aren't used to hearing a bass line as the lead, and then all of a sudden hearing, you know, these synths kind of going back and forth, kind of like the opposite. Normally you'll hear a lead synth. And then, you know, which will be like a regular, you know, like FM synth or something like that. And then you'll hear a bass line come in afterwards, maybe do like a kind of funky bass thing, kind of like an Earth Defense Force or something like that. But usually bass lines stay in the background. That's where they're supposed to be. Right. So obviously this person is a huge Iron Maiden fan. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just infer that from the fact that yeah. the bass is loud. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Well, I mean, like in Iron Maiden songs, like the bass line is pretty much a lead Right, but they could be a well. Rush fan too. I mean, oh, true. a lot of lead bass or yeah. Primus. You know, yeah. there's a lot of bands out there that kind of do that and get noticed sure. for that too. Yeah. Which is cool. It is, absolutely. Yeah. No, I really like Nothing this. Nothing wrong with bass. It's got, it's got organ sounds to it too a bit. Yeah, um, yeah, the SNES version, and then you kind of hear that a little bit in the X68000 right. version as well. You know, that might have been what they were trying to go for, or what Mieko was trying to go for in the PC-88 version, but mm -hmm. the the 2203 FM synth in the PC-88, I don't think, was just strong enough to really bring out the brilliance of the soundtrack. Mm -hmm. So they tried their best. Yeah, oh, and well. then we have the Oath and Felgana oh, I love uh, this soundtrack. version, which uh, I didn't like mm -hmm. the intro. But man, once the guitar gets going, it's, it's that really breakdown good. towards the end is yeah. fantastic. Yeah, it's really good. Yeah, so this this version came out a good decade after the original versions of Yeast Three did, and it really kind of turned things on its ear. It made it a little more like the other Ease games. Plays like a, like we said, a little bit more like Zelda. Yeah. 
you, you have the ability to put it on easy mode too, so you can ramp the difficulty down a little bit. <laughs> Which is good, because this had, is a really difficult game. I had myself a little solo Yeez party yesterday. I, I kind of went through and, and booted up every single version of Yeez that I could possibly get my hands on, just to kind of compare and contrast everything. Of just Yeez 3, you mean? Right, right, right yeah, right. a Yeez 3 party. Yeah. And, uh... <laughs> And so, you know, most of them, it's like I couldn't even get past the third enemy in the first dungeon. It's insane. I yeah. don't know how I got through the entire game when I was a kid. Oh, I didn't. I, I, I just I, didn't. Like, I got I... to the boss. I don't know if I ever ended up beating it, but, man, I, I, I just, like, you get hit twice in the yeah. first dungeon and you're dead. Yeah. It's insanity. No, pretty much. I mean, it's the kind of game where you have to go really, really, really slow. I guess that's why the song is called Be Careful. Yeah. It plays in the first dungeon. So. I remember like having, like, I remember playing Yeast 3 like Zelda and just rushing into stuff and just dying and really just oh, hating. Oh yeah, you can't do Like that. just giving up on the game. And then I realized, you know, years and years later that no, if I'm gonna get far in this game, you've gotta, you know, duck and, you know, kind of shimmy over and stab the guy, you know. You're like shanking everybody, basically. Yeah, yeah, you've basically. only got one move, yeah. or you know, essentially three moves. You've got a ducking stab, like an overhead standing swipe, mm -hmm. and then you can kind of shove your sword awkwardly upward yeah. to get those little bats that are incessantly flying over your head. Mm -hmm. but that's all you really have. Yeah. Oath and Felgana really kind of changes that up. You have combos you can do. It's, it feels more like I don't know, uh, like it's a more God modern. War almost feel to the combat yeah. to it, which makes it a lot of fun. It's more modern. I mean, the game design is better. It's just, I mean, playing a game like Wanderers from E is just, gameplay-wise, it's just brutal. Yeah, yeah. So. And there is a built-in version uh, or a built-in debug menu on the SNES version so you can give yourself infinite life and all that oh, that's cool. stuff, which, I don't know, maybe I used it when I was a kid to get through the game. I don't remember doing it, but um, I don't know if those exist in the other versions if they're in the Genesis Maybe. version. I don't know. Um, you know, like I said, I did, did play a whole bunch of versions of this game. And the PC-88 version, man, it's Brutal. bad. Is it? Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's good for the PC-88. I mean, I've played other PC-88 games. I can definitely um, attest to the fact that at least this game has scrolling stages. Whereas on the PC-88, the earlier games mostly were just static screens that you would walk through. Mm -hmm. um, this one is kind of choppy. It moves along at like five frames per second, oh but you boy. can definitely walk. And there's parallax scrolling, which was oh, that's almost cool. unheard of yeah, yeah. on that system. That's true. And, uh, you know, for the, for the kind of game it is, it it's pretty good. I mean, I can't, I can't fault it. I can see why it ended up being ported to other systems because, A, it was part of, you know, the E's pedigree, which is popular to begin with, mm -hmm. um, but also it was a pretty decent version. When you get to the X68000 version, it looks much more like the Genesis okay. version, except it's got an even wider color palette, coupled with the really good music. It's just an overall more polished game, I think. The Genesis and the X68000 version, sound-wise and, and graphics-wise, are both very, very, very close to each other. Yeah. The SNES version took it a little bit further, you know, with the higher color palette. Right. Um, characters are a little bit smaller, Yeah, I think, true. but the resolution is a little bit higher, which was a cool thing about the NES version, that actually most of the Yeez 3 games take place in like a window yeah. on the screen, and then you have all your stats below you. Mm -hmm. On the NES version, it's the full screen, so there's no borders. You mean the SNES version? No, the NES version. Oh, there is an NES yeah. version, that's right. Yeah, yeah I, I've heard the soundtrack. The soundtrack to the NES version is really good. It is really good. Yeah, um, it only came out in Japan, though. Yeah. yeah, we can post some of that stuff on our Facebook page. Yeah. I was, you know, there's, I'm already playing four tracks, I was trying yeah, to pick yeah, my yeah. favorites, but <laughs> the NES version definitely deserves it's some recognition, really too. really good, the NES music. It's, um, it's, uh, it's excellent. Yeah, so I actually did a, I can post this, too. I did a a little remix where I played the SNES and the NES versions together and kind of switched them back and forth, but used the SNES mm -hmm. rhythm section throughout the entire song. So okay. maybe I'll put that up on SoundCloud. And That'd be kind of guys neat, it's a It's a very good compare and contrast between the SNES and NES versions. And it's of Be Careful, too. It's of this song. So right. it'd be cool to listen to. Oh, that's neat. And, and then the Super Nintendo, the Super Nintendo version was the only version that had that little intro. Do you remember the the intro? The cinematic. Yeah, the cinematic. Yeah, yeah. Uh, as far as I know, I did not see that in any other version okay. that I played. 
aside from the TurboGrafx 16 CD version, right, uh, which also has well, that is probably an animated cinematic. It's it's uh this is more like similar to the Super Nintendo. There's yeah. a little more animation, but it's not like full motion video, or right? Like well, that. this one's more like Ninja Gaiden style, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. like animated pictures and then or... stuff dropping, like the glass, the crystal ball it's drops and, and shatters. All all right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. And then uh, Oath and Felgana is fully dialogued. There's there's English or Japanese version voice for all of the main actors in the game, and the graphics are absolutely phenomenal. The music kicks ass. Mm -hmm. It's just it's it's a worthwhile definitely a worthwhile. Play. I, I it was the last game that I played in my little ease party last night, <laughs> uh, and I couldn't put it down. I just kept playing it. Yeah. And uh, I got through the first dungeon and on to the second, and I'm just going to keep playing it through because I didn't realize what a fantastic game it was. Cool. I'll have to check so, it out. I really wanted it to come out on a system that I owned back when I heard it was coming out for the PC because I, I enjoyed Wanderers from Ease on Super Nintendo and I was like, oh, this is getting a remake? Oh, that sucks. I don't, I don't want to play it on PC. And then when I found out it came out on PSP, I ended up getting 7 instead because they released for oh, yeah, 7 yeah, yeah. and didn't like it. I, yeah, you know what? I played I 4 like and 5 it. after enjoying 3 so much yeah. and I was like, this doesn't, it's, because 3 is the only side scroller I think they ever made. Yeah. That's so true. I was not expecting, you know, the traditional kind of RPG style. Right. So maybe now that I'm a little bit more older, I'll, I'll go back to it and see if it's more Does enjoyable. it start off where you're going through the town and and just wasting time? Because that was my big issue with with Seven is you land this, uh, you're on a ship and you land and you're just walking around this town aimlessly and you can't really figure out where to go. Like that is the most annoying part of our Are you talking about Oath and Felgana? Well, no, and now I'm talking about Seven. So I'm, I'm asking is, is Oath and Felgana the same? Where when you get off, like when you arrive in Redmond, in the town of Redmond, isn't it Redmond? Redmond, right? I think that's the name of the town. Well, in Felgana, you arrive in Felgana. <laughs> Oh, okay, so it's not, okay. Because <laughs> if I recall, in Ye in Wonders from Yeez, you land in a town called Redmond. Oh, they might have changed it they for the American version. It. Right. Well, no, I know that's the North American version for Wonders from Yeez. It was yeah. called, yeah. yeah so but maybe they, right, Japanese so they version. probably just changed the name of the town or whatever, yeah. which is fine. But do you land in the town and then you got to like just walk around the town aimlessly with no direction whatsoever or... Is it more... No, I mean, they, you basically, it's a little bit different than the, um, than the, the original Nintendo. console right, versions, okay. because you start off in the town in the console versions, but oh, you do okay. get off a ship. Okay. But it's all very linear, you know, there's a, there's a girl that needs rescue at the beginning and you fight off some wolves. So oh. it's kind of similar to the cutscene, so you actually play through, like, the cutscene oh, stuff. Oh, okay, cool. But then you get to the town and it kind of tells you who you need to go see, hmm. and you, you pretty much, there's not a very big town, so you just go to the right house, you talk to the right person. Right. And then, then it kind of gets into the actual use storyline where, Somebody comes in and says there's monsters coming out of this cave. Right. And then it basically directs you right to the cave. And then you go and That's you, cool. you fight your, your first um, yeah. your first battle in the core. That's so. my biggest issue with these games is just they take forever to get going. Yeah, no, this, most one, of them. this one got into the action pretty quickly. That's cool. Yeah. You know me, because I'm, I'm an instant action kind of guy just right. like you. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I, I got right in there and started yeah. playing, so yep. no yep. complaints about that. So cool. Cool. you're gonna say that your your favorite version is the SNES version? Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna call it a tie between the SNES and the X68000. SNES yeah. because of nostalgia, okay. because it feels like that's the way it should be, yeah. and then the X68000 because, I don't know, I'm just an X68000 fanboy. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I just really love the, the fact that they turned a lead, uh, a baseline into a lead synth. I think that's the real yeah, hook no, for me. That and really the cool. organs, yeah. Really but enjoyed it. Uh, I really like that Ulthan Falcana remix. So it's good stuff. All right, let's take a look at our next game and our next track, which is Albatross Munitions Base or Power Plant, depending on the version. This is Bionic Commando, and we'll be playing a track from the NES version and then Bionic Commando Rearmed for modern systems. Thank you. 
was Junko Tamiya's Albatross Munitions Base from Bionic Commando, and this is Simon Vicklin's reimagining of the track for Bionic Commando Rearmed. Popular Opinion Gamer! Well, it looks like another typical day at the local video game store. There's two guys arguing over which is better, the Sega Genesis or the Super Nintendo. I wonder if anybody with an unpopular opinion might stop by. Listen, Mortal Kombat was way better on the Super Nintendo. The controls were tight and the graphics were superior. Who cares about all that blood stuff anyways? No way, man. It was much tighter on the Sega Genesis. And plus, without the blood, it's just a crappier version of the real thing. I'm gonna have to disagree with both of you hooligans. Well, the Amiga port of Mortal Kombat was exclusive to the European market, making it a great import choice, with Alistair Brimble supplying a minimalist soundtrack. It really had the best and simplest layout with only two action buttons. Uh, okay. Uh, well, we can at least all agree that Street Fighter 2 is the best on the Super Nintendo. I mean, tightest graphics and controls, plus that soundtrack was totally killer. No way, man. 
True six-button action with the Championship Edition blew away the original Street Fighter II thanks to the Genesis. Uh, actually, the FM Towns Marty version of Super Street Fighter II had the best graphics, sound, and best handling out of all the versions. You two should really do some homework before you have an opinion. <laughs> Dude, who are you? Yeah, seriously. Just your average everyday gamer! Uh, okay. Well, anyways, flashback. I prefer the Super Nintendo version. Oh man, the Genesis version was far superior. You guys are really missing out. Atari Jaguar version of flashback is where it's at. Nerd. Yeah, you're just a big nerd. All oh, this happens every time. Whoa. Check out more of Nick's adventures in gaming this Wednesday on the NES Network. NES Network. Mm -mm, I love me some Bionic Commando. You don't, and that saddens me. <laughs> you know, I just, the game's confusing to me, that's all. I don't know. I don't know if it's the numbers. Confusing. Yeah. Like, oh, you mean like on the map screen and, yeah. and getting through? I also just learned that I don't like the fact that you can't jump. I know that's the whole point of the game, but I just that seems so limiting to me. They added the ability to jump in Bionic Commando Rearm 2. Yeah? And that's the reason I don't like the game. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I need to sit down. and I mean, well, I watched you play through it recently. And right, I, at that same, yeah, same party we were talking about. Yeah. I did play through the game. Yes. I was, uh, that was like, what, after 10 o'clock at night? Yeah. And I'm... I've got kids. I have to get up early for work. I was yeah. I was seriously like half asleep playing through that. I'm surprised I got through it as well as I did. I think, yeah. I think I actually had to use a continue, which I never ever usually have to do when I'm playing through that the NES version. Yeah. Oh well. So that was the music that plays in the NES version when you get to the last like four or five levels of the game. It's this kind of labyrinthine high-tech looking maze-like place that you have to get through. Uh, you know, it's pretty cool. It's got kind of a, I don't know, I don't know if I want to call it like jazzy or slick, but it's got like that like bass line. It's just really fun. Drunko Tommy really did an excellent job. Like we were talking about when you played the Little Nemo track. Little Nemo track. Yeah. You know, her songs just don't sound the same. I, no. I can't figure out, because most composers, you can definitely tell, oh, totally Tim Fallen. Oh, right. totally Barry Leach. But this is like, that's Junko Tommy. Oh, I didn't realize that. Mm -hmm. So really interesting. She she built upon a lot of the like more military kind of sounds that the original Commando had. And even though the games were completely separate, I think she used a lot of that same those same like marching melodies that the original arcade game. Yeah, it's very did. militant sounding. Yeah, with those snare rolls and everything. Yeah. So it was a lot of fun to uh, to both listen to and play. The soundtrack, I mean, it's not my favorite soundtrack in the world. It was just kind of, I guess, there for me <laughs> when I was playing it. I mean, I played it so much, it's almost like you don't even realize it's there after a little while. And, and I think probably be that's one of the reasons why I think it fits so well with the game is that it kind of almost blends into the experience. It's not like like a Wolverine or something where the game is awful, but the music is so good. And you're yeah. like, yeah, this music is excellent. But with Bionic Commando, it just kind of forms the whole package because everything just seems to fit so nicely. So, I don't, see, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't necessarily... I, I wouldn't necessarily say that for me personally with most games. Mm. Like... Yeah, there's some games that have really terrible music, so you play them just for the music, which is sad, but... <laughs> you mean terrible gameplay? Yeah, like, the game itself is really awful. Like, Wolverine, for example, for NES. Great soundtrack, awful game. Right. Then there's games like, you know, any of the Mega Man games, the six, you know, the 8-bit eight, Mega Man games on the NES, where, it, to me, the music is, is the experience in and of itself, mm. along with the excellent gameplay, so it's like... If you took the soundtrack out of that game, I could not play that game. Exactly, that's the way I feel right. with Bionic Commando. Oh, okay, that so they're I'm... just part of a cohesive oh, I package. See what you, mean. you know okay. what I mean? Okay, I get what you're saying. Yeah, it's it's kind of like you couldn't play the game without the music. Right. right. But, but even though I love the game so much, I guess with with Mega Man in your 
case, you could listen to the Mega Man soundtrack by itself and oh, really yeah. enjoy it. Oh, yeah. Like, for me... You couldn't listen I mean, to the Bionic Commando? I could listen to it, yeah, but yeah. it wouldn't give me the same feeling as, like, listening to a Tim Fallon song. You would want to, like, play the game while you're listening. The music it. sounds better when you're playing the game along. Okay, I guess okay. is what I'm trying to break it down. Gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> okay, all right, I can see that. Yeah, there's there's not a lot of games that I could say that with. Yeah. But, yeah, that's true. On the other hand, um, Simon Vicklin's rearmed soundtrack... Oh my god, it's so freaking good. <laughs> literally, and I say literally a lot, but I really mean it this time. Like one of my favorite video game soundtracks of all time. Um, it's just got that that kind of big beat Chemical Brothers prodigy feel that I, I love. It takes all of the, you know like when some remixers or arrangers do uh, an updated version of a soundtrack and they kind of like, they either leave parts out or they vary the melody like so it much it that it's because like, they want to make it their own yeah it makes it kind of hard to recognize yeah yeah, yeah. Ficklin took the melodies of the song like almost note for note but just transformed each of the songs into something that sounds completely different from how it originally sounded like mm -hmm. like the nes score and this this particular song sounds again like we were talking kind of militant marchy but the Score from Rearm, this particular track, just sounds like some sort of a gritty underground rave. It's just so good. I don't even know. It, the, the beat falls on different notes, but it uses the same melody, so it accentuates different parts of the melody. I mean, I'm getting really in-depth here, but that's Sick. because I'm so familiar with both of the songs. Right, right. I just think the feel of the song changes, and it just turns a soundtrack that I'm extremely familiar with, but didn't consider one of my favorite soundtracks, into something that I just really, really enjoy. And I think I've played Bionic Commando, the NES version, more than I've actually listened to the soundtrack by itself, but I've mm -hmm. definitely listened to the Bionic Commando Rearm soundtrack much more than I've actually mm -hmm. played the game. Interesting. Yeah, well, I know it's not your kind of music. It's very aggressive um, and... and, and no, I like aggressive really, music. No, no, I no. Just, I mean, uh, uh, aggressive electronics, I guess. You're not right. as much into as I am. I like a lot more subdued electronics. I either like the really happy, bouncy stuff, mm -hmm. or I like the more bass-driven, boogie type of, like, electro-type stuff. Yeah. Um, so you like your heavy music acid. on guitars, and I like my heavy music on, key on you know, like, synths and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I just... I, I would go with the NES version. Uh, as That's far what as, I figured you'd say. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I just think that the NES, in, in, in most cases... I, I tend to notice that there's so much that you can listen to in an, an NES track that remains hidden. Like, I'll be honest, I'll listen to Mega Man 3 soundtrack, going back to Mega Man, and still to this day, I will hear new parts of the melodies that I either never heard before or I've heard them, but I always kind of never paid attention to them. Yeah. Same thing with Super Nintendo as well, or really just anything in the 16-bit era. You'll hear something and then you'll be like, oh, that's a cool lead line or whatever, but then you'll you'll start pulling it apart, like Storm Eagle, for example. I will pull that track apart and I can hear the different lead lines going at different paces, different trails of the music. Spark Mandrels is another one where the notes are behind. And I did this like weird thing on YouTube where I, I um, on my channel, this was a while back, I posted something called Super Nintendo Music School. And I was, I was going through some of my old videos and I found it and listened to it again. And it's basically me sitting in front of a computer diagnosing each with an emulator, diagnosing each sound. Like isolating each? Yeah, like isolating them and then kind of making my own remixes. And I used to do that, do that all the time when I was in like college where I would sit around and I would just play around with emulators and listen to the, each individual audio tracks. And so with a lot of those songs, I can now in my head pull apart the individual parts and listen to them. And I think with a track like, you know, Albatross Munition Space, it's the same thing. I can pull that track apart and listen to it and find so much more in the NES song than I could in the Power Plant song. And, and I don't think that the Bionic Rearm Commando soundtrack, uh, or the Bionic Commando Rearm soundtrack <laughs> is a bad soundtrack, not at all. I just more think that I can listen to the NES version and get so much more out of it personally yeah. than I could for Power Plant, because I feel like with Rearmed, everything's laid out for you. And that's unfortunate in most modern day soundtracks is all the music and all the notes and everything that you're listening to is laid out for you. It's like, 
here you go. This is very easy to digest audio, audio like audio wise. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I kind of. Maybe it's just me. Well, it's like becoming a wine connoisseur. Yeah. Anybody can drink wine. Right. And say this tastes like fermented grape juice. Sure. But you're not, <laughs> you're not gonna, and, and I'm kind of, you know, using flavor notes as well sure. as musical notes at sure, the same sure. time. You're, you're gonna be able to pick that stuff out of stuff because you really enjoy it. You don't become right. a wine taster when you hate wine. True. You know? Yeah. So That's very true. the feeling that you're getting about the NES music where you can go back and pick things out, I mean, I could do the same thing with the rearmed mm. soundtrack. But right. Because I listen to so much electronic, aggressive style music, mm -hmm. I have more to compare and contrast it right. with. Yeah. And because I'm so familiar with the original NES soundtrack, I can kind of tell, mm -hmm. you know, like this particular string of notes, mm -hmm. I, it sounds different because Simon Viglund put the downbeat on this measure instead, right, of, instead you know, of instead of where, it was. where on like like Tamiya would use like light snare rolls under the bass line like right. da, 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 there'd be a little snare roll under that but like Vicklin would would like put the downbeat a really strong downbeat and like da, 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 and it would really yeah, yeah, rock yeah. out right so it's just that kind of stuff that I noticed that you probably wouldn't just because you're right. not your ears aren't tuned to that kind of stuff. Right, so it's, right. a, it's an agree to disagree kind of thing. Yeah, basically. yeah. I'm not saying I couldn't pick up on it audibly. I probably could. It's just. But it's the amount of appreciation you have. Right, exactly. Yeah. So, anyways, yeah. Uh, I'm... Long, got up on a long tangent there, but. Yeah. I'm really interested for our listeners which yeah. version, because we, we're, we're kind of a little, you know, at odds about this. Sure. Do you like the NES version better? Do you like the rearm version better? Let us know in the comments, because I'm really curious to see how many listeners are going to go with the NES version over the rearmed version. Or don't let us know and eat some cheese. You know, whatever. Or eat some cheese and then let us know. Yeah. Let us know how your cheese was. Let us know. Does cheese increase your, your appreciation for Bionic Commando's yes. soundtrack? Yeah, eat some cheddar and then eat some American and tell us which is better Compare. and which tastes Trust. more like Bionic Commando <laughs> and which tastes more like Bionic Commando rearmed. No, man, if, if, if the NES version is American cheese, yeah. then cheddar, sharp cheddar would definitely be rearmed. See, I would say the opposite. Yeah. I know. Yeah. It's cool. Yeah. I'm not faulty. Oh, I'm a that. big sharp cheddar fan. I'm just saying. Vermont sharp cheddar, brah. Wah. What up? What up? Cheesin'. Cheesin' with we got. Yeah, cheesin' with we got. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Man, oh, man. So, our next track is from Earthworm Jim. Earthworm Jim. Yes. Ow! I love this game. <laughs> Uh, so then we're gonna do the New Junk City track, and we're doing three different versions. Uh, so we're gonna do the Genesis, Super Nintendo, and Sega CD versions of these, of this wonderful game, and then we'll talk a little bit about it right after the break.
That version you heard is the Mark Miller composed Genesis version. We're now going to go into the Super NES version that is also composed by Mark Miller. Welcome back. That was the Sega CD arranged version of the song New Junk City, and that is on the very first Earthworm Jim game. I am gonna go and say that I like the Super Nintendo version the best out of the three. And, and I don't really care if anyone hates me for saying it. You know, uh, <laughs> it's, 
I don't dislike the Super Nintendo version. I'm gonna say that the instrumentation is probably better on the Super Nintendo, but I can't get past those lousy drum samples. Yeah, that's and the... In New Junk City, it's like the... That, that heavy percussion is yeah. kind of like what makes the song. After listening to them back and back to back, I keep saying back and back. After listening to them back to back, the Genesis has better drums on this song. I 100% agree with you. The drums sound really flat sounding on the Super Nintendo version. It sounds like they sampled the Genesis drums, Maybe. but then like cut the sample off at the last yeah. minute. The drums sound like they don't finish the note, right. almost as if it's like half a note. But the Super Nintendo version does have better instrumentation. I think that each instrument sounds individualized, it sounds different, whereas the Genesis version all sounds the same. Every, yeah, every synth sounds, not that the song is bad on the Genesis, I just think that it there doesn't sound. There wasn't a lot sound, of variation. In right, there wasn't a lot of variation, so a lot of the instruments that are more pronounced in the Super NES version, especially during that bass breakdown, where it's just like do 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 you are able to hear the synth better on the Super Nintendo, whereas the Genesis, it kind of fades into the background. It's a little bit more muddy sounding. So I got to give it up to the Super NES version, not only for nostalgia purposes, but I don't know. I mean, I only own this game on the on the Super Nintendo and I've seen people play it on the Genesis and it's not a bad game on, on the Genesis. It's great on both. Yeah. I think it plays a little bit better on, it's like the, the, your it's... typical kind of SNES versus Genesis thing. It <laughs> plays a little bit better on the Genesis, right. but it looks a little bit better on the SNES. Right, so right, So yeah. just the way it goes. Yeah. But overall, I mean, you gotta hand it to Tommy Tallarico for kind of combining mm -hmm. the best of the SNES and the Genesis versions into yeah. one package for the Sega CD True. version. I you mean, know, it's, it sounds very similar to the SNES version, but it's actually got the good drum samples in it, right. so it sounds really nice. It's got individualized mm -hmm. instrumentation, but it also has this, the tight drums of the Genesis as far as that goes. So yeah, no, I agree with you. I think the Sega CD version is technically the best version. I'd still go with the Super Nintendo version though for, I don't know, I guess that has that nostalgia purpose. I never played it on Sega CD, so I don't know. It plays really similar to the yeah. Genesis, Genesis version. version. That you know, makes sense, with, yeah. Better graphics, better music. Well, the graphics aren't really even that much. I mean, the Sega CD didn't really give you that much in terms of graphic power over the standard Genesis did. It just allowed yeah. for, you know, better sound samples, better music, some extra content here and there. But I, I've played the first couple levels of the special edition, the mm -hmm. Sega CD version, but not enough to really know if there's anything really significant right. that it offers beyond the Genesis version. I think there might be an extra level in the Sega CD version, if you I recall. You may be right. Yeah. The Super NES version, I think, had better voice sound samples. Like for Jim, I think his yeah, was in, yeah, they were a little bit more clear, a little bit more enunciated. Like our next game coming up? <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so before we get to that, we'll talk a little bit about the composers and, and uh, arrangers. Mark Miller wrote this track. He wrote the entire soundtrack for the first Earthworm Jim, which is not a common fact because Tommy Tallarico did the Sega CD version. Everybody, everybody credits everybody. Tommy for doing the uh, right, all three versions. Right, and that's not true because Mark Miller actually was the composer on these tracks. So he used to be a main composer and sound designer over at Sega of America, and he basically worked on... Started working for Shiny. Like, yeah. Yeah, and uh, he he joined this group, or he founded this group called Neuromantic Productions, and basically a group of music and sound composers, and uh, the group also created Gems, which is a piece of music software that it was created exclusively for the Sega Genesis. It's truly, truly, truly outrageous. <laughs> I think you've made that joke before. Really? Yeah. Damn. Yeah. I gotta get more. You're recycling your jokes, my Man, friend. I don't remember saying that joke, but you might be right. Well, it is. <laughs> if you did or did not say that joke, it is truly, truly, truly outrageous. Jem. <laughs> he did. Jem uh, is also regarded as being the worst sound driver available. For is it really? Oh so wow! I'm just putting that out there. So it's not truly, <laughs> truly, truly outrageous. Well, Mark Miller used it well because, like, you know, like we've talked about, in, like the Hitoshi Sakimoto songs where, you know, if you create the driver, you're probably the best one to use it. Yeah, but that's true. But the Gems sound driver has been used to very ill effect at times, and it's one of the main reasons why Genesis gets its bad rep for having terrible music. It's all in what you do with it. Right. And that's what we've been saying. It's not the size the of your driver, it's how you use it. <laughs> it's, oh my god. Oh boy. <laughs> we are going to get kicked off Red Shore Junkies. Oh, they love us. They, we love them. They, we do love them, but they probably hate us. <laughs> saying stuff like that. Yeah, he mainly works with a lot of 
I guess you could say licensed stuff, stuff like Tasmania, Spider-Man, all the stuff mostly on the Genesis. Uh, Pink Goes to Hollywood, which is that Pink Panther game. Taz and Escape from Mars, Andre Agassi Tennis, Robocop versus Terminator. You know, a lot of very Genesis sounding game. Hey, you know, if you're a composer and you don't have a Japanese name, you're going to end up doing licensed titles at some point. True. It's pretty much the way he it goes. He also did Action 52, though, which... Oh, he did? He did. Neat. He did, yes. That was unlicensed. Yeah, his last game huh. was... And he did X-Men 2 Clone Wars, which was a great soundtrack. Uh, his last soundtrack was Walt Disney World Quest Magical Racing Tour on the Dreamcast, PS1, and Game Boy Color. I think that one's M-rated, right? Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> You know, it'd be cool to hear the Game Boy Color version. I bet it's really good. Yeah, because he also did he did all well additional music. So I'm not sure exactly how much of the music he did additional music. Damn it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So as far as Tommy Tallarico, we've talked him up to death. So I mean, we've shared our experiences and discussions about Tommy Tallarico. So I don't think we'll get too much into him. I actually found out recently he did. Tomorrow Never Dies, which supposedly has a really good soundtrack. I need to check that out. Yeah, in 64? No, no, the PS1. Oh, okay. Yeah, it cool. only came out on PS1. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. okay. I'm thinking yeah, of it. Yeah, it's like yeah, yeah. GoldenEye came out on N64, and that was, of course, done by Grant Kirkhope. And then, for whatever reason, they lost the license or title to Bond games with MGM, and then they, you know, they went over to M MGM, I guess, approached I think it was, was it Activision? Yeah, that sounds familiar. Was it? Yeah, or EA. I think it was EA, actually. Because I know they came out with the later games from the PS2 and GameCube era, but I could be wrong about that. But anyways, Tommy Tallarico did the soundtrack for Tomorrow Never Dies for the movie, or for the game of the movie, so. The game, the movie, the, the video? The game, the movie, the, yeah, the veal? The veal? I said the video. <laughs> Have you ever had Tomorrow Never Dies, The Veal? It's it delicious. published by Electronic Arts, you are That's correct. That's what I thought, yeah, 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 yeah. No, I don't think Activision ever got the license for Bond. <laughs> Anyways, Earthworm Jim is just this wacky platform game that I think kind of made fun of a lot of platform games at the time. Yeah, and it a lot like of an just action cartoons platform. and convention, you yeah. know, like, I don't know. The best part of Earthworm Jim is when you beat the game, the cow that you had launched in the first level lands on the princess. In the, in the uh, end when you save her. Well, that's why it never comes down. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I never cared about Earthworm Jim enough to actually Oh, man. Like that's her. like the funniest part. The, the show is so good. Like, I know you're not a cartoon guy, but you really need to watch that cartoon. Yeah. Well, Harry, Harry Scherr did the voice of Earthworm Jim. No, actually, right? it was uh, Dan Castanella. Oh, okay. The voice of Homer. Homer yeah, Simpson. Yeah, yeah. I just and there's the names so mixed up. many moments where you hear Homer. Yeah, I believe it. Yeah. Yeah. Like, anytime he's yelling anything, like, the bitter... The... Uh, Whatever you old hag, what, the bitter, the bitter fruit brings crime. You old, what is it? The weed of crime. The bears weed of bitter fruit. You yes, old hag. The weed of crime <laughs> bears bitter fruit. You old hag. And you could totally hear Homer Simpson's voice the That's entire awesome. time. Yeah, and uh, actually, he did the voice for Earthworm Jim. I think in three, in Earthworm Jim 3D, and he did the voice for Earthworm Jim in Clay Fighter. Cool. Yeah. So just. Ow. A bit. Yeah. Well, no, he didn't do that voice. No, I know. Yeah. I wonder who did that voice. That though. was actually Doug Tenapple, if I really? recall, the creator. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So now you know. <laughs> Ow! Now I can go to bed and know that I know. My favorite part, which I was sorely disappointed in the Genesis version, is in the Super NES version, when you press the button after you end the level, you just can keep making Jim say groovy over and over again. Just groovy, 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 groovy. Over and over. Can't again. do that in the Super Nintendo version. No, that's what I'm saying. You can do it in the oh, Super oh, Nintendo Genesis version. version. I don't you think you can do it in the Genesis version. Genesis does, but Nintendo don't. No, the other way around. Nintendo does. It's opposite day. Nintendo does. What's Genesis don't? What would be a good? Nintendo does what Genesis isn't. Yeah, there you go. That's right. Take that, <laughs> Sega. <laughs> Right. I should have been writing for them back in the day when right. I was like eight years old. Yeah, you know. Hey guys, I can help you beat Sega. <laughs> I was like sucking on my lollipop backwards hat. <laughs> Why were you sucking on a lollipop? Because I was eight. I don't know. <laughs> you had like glasses. The, the still had the beard though. Black glasses. You still had the beard. Yeah. At eight. Beard. Eight. I can't picture you without a beard, so that makes sense. <laughs> exactly. I think that one time you shaved your beard, and I was like, "Who are you? Get out of my house!" It's bizarre because I started growing the beard like a week before I met you. Really? Yeah. Yeah. 
You're like, I need to look so now, it. For you, I have permabeard, but for me, yeah. it's relatively new. Right, right. Anywho. Anywho. Let's get on with our next song selection. Speaking of bad vocal samples. I'm bad! This is going to be Bad Dudes for the arcade and the NES. Excuse me. The name of the game is Bad Dudes versus Dragon Ninja. Ninja. You're right. You cannot forget the Dragon and Ninja part. This will be continuing Mike's podcast career long tradition yes of picking songs that sound like castlevania Grease Lightning, and that was from the Bad Dudes vs. Dragon Ninja Arcade, composed by Azusa Hara and Hiroaki Yoshida. And coming up next, we're going to listen to the NES version. Thank you. 
Welcome back. That was the NES version of Bad Dudes vs. Dragon Ninja. It's really just called Bad Dudes on the NES. And that song's called Grease Lightning. And that was arranged by Masaki Iwasaka, Shogu Sakai, Takafumi Mayura, Yuji Suzuki, Yusuke Takahama, and Ai Uchida. A lot, a lot of people for one NES game. A lot of people for one NES game to arrange, yeah. Data East needs to, I don't know, maybe that's why Turn they weren't successful after a while. <laughs> this <laughs> 10 people to work on five tracks. This track, in my opinion, is better on the Nintendo. Yeah, I mean, I agree. Yeah. I'm not a big fan of either. I'm not a big fan of the game itself. You don't like the game. You just go home. I agree. I, <laughs> I mean, the, ar the, ar the arcade version is definitely better than the NES. Yeah, version, I think the, the hit far. detection is awful on the NES version. It's really bad. Like, it's just be, stiff, man. I mean, yeah. Robocop walks more gracefully than these guys do on the NES it's version. funny you say that because Data East also did the first Robocop. I know, that's why I yeah. said it. Because yeah. I think they're also based on the same engine. Oh, but it's I love even... the first Robocop game on the NES. I could beat it in 15 minutes. Yeah, I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just yeah. saying that Robocop is more graceful than the bad dudes. <laughs> yeah, these, these these bad dudes are not so bad. I mean, they they're bad in a bad way. You know, especially in the in the NES version, they look like they're wearing sweatpants, <laughs> yes. like sweatpants and a wife beater. Like that is not. Yeah, just woke up, realized the president's been kidnapped, roll out of bed, still got Cheerios in your stomach. <laughs> Do you think that? I'm just thinking like, did these guys wake up and they saw the news and they were like. Screw it, I know what I'm doing today. Yeah, I guess I'm a bad enough dude. Uh, okay, let's go. They saw that announcement with Duke Nukem. Uh, it's got crossed asking, in his eyes. Yeah, yeah, asking, you know, are you a bad enough dude? That's why hit detection is so bad. Yeah, yeah. They're just kind of like <laughs> flailing their fists around at the guys and oh, those dragon man. ninjas. And they're not dragon ninjas. No. Not like dragons and ninjas. No. They're dragon, like they're so tired, they're just yeah. dragon ninjas. It's like 3 a.m. and they're trying to fight you, each other. You know, you fight a lot city. of weird stuff. I mean, you fight these female ninjas, these Kunoichi. Yeah. And, uh, but then you also fight these dogs, and I always felt bad about hurting the dogs in the game. Killing dogs is, is kind it's, of always... It's always like a no-no. Going, going as far back as like Wolfenstein. Yeah. You know, killing those dogs. No, that's not cool. It's not, it's not cool. Eddie's been playing the most recent Tomb Raider. Oh, really? And uh, wait, the PS3 one? Yeah, PS3, Xbox, Xbox 360 right, version, PC, the one right, by right. Square Enix. Yeah. And uh, you got to fight these wolves, and they're vicious. Mm -hmm. But even after killing them, you're like, oh, I just killed a dog. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. even though it was trying to bite my head off. Yeah. I just don't like doing it. I know. Anyways, so the game is basically uh, it's a beat 'em up, and it's a if you can call it that. Yeah. I guess. It plays kind of like um, Kung Fu, I guess you could say. Yeah, Kung it does, it does. On I two mean, levels. A little bit uh, Double Dragon, a little bit Kung Fu. And a little bit bad. And a little bit bad. And a little bit dudes. And a little bit dudes. But mostly bad. <laughs> but mostly dudes. Bad dudes. Yeah. The, ar the, arcade, <laughs> the arcade version plays a lot better. I, I do agree. It's smoother. It's smoother. And, you know, yeah. this, is, this is at the era where arcade hardware was eons more advanced than your home consoles. But just were. the NES so everything was a so popular that right, they were like, like everything came to it. We need to come out with a version of this game. And you know, it for what it's worth, it's not a bad version. It's just it's got some problems with hit detection. Right. It's still in my opinion the soundtrack is better here. This track specifically stands out. This is such a great track. Uh really has that great like rock hard rock element to oh, it yeah, and totally. the breakdown but then it also has like this very melodic almost like dance beat kind of like that dun, 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 dun. it's yeah. very yeah it's very castlevania some of the instruments in the arcade version though kind of merge in together which is my biggest problem with arcade hardware older fm like, hardware so, yeah this was a 2203 as well yep. so same, same stuff thing. that's in the pc yeah just like the later part uh before the loop goes up uh, it goes up an octave, which is really cool. Yeah. That sounds great. Uh, the NES drums are just so freaking awesome. I mean, I love the the drum rolls, like the the toms and the different noises that they use are just really sharp, really crisp. Um, the breakdown, though, I gotta admit, kind of sounds a bit weak. The da 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 da. That's more of like an FM synth. Yeah. Strength. Oh there, yeah. Doing no, I agree. Guitars. It's just it it could have sounded so much meatier on like a Super Nintendo or maybe a Genesis, but like here it just kind of sounds really flat. And then you get back up to the the high energy synths, like the really strong melodies, and the, that's where the I, I think that's where the NES succeeds. 
is melodies. I think that's my big thing is, and that's why I think I really love the NES sound hardware is because melodies are king on the NES. True. I mean, just- you With can, both square channels, you can right, really make them harmonize well. You can well. just make everything sound so good. I mean, everything like from the various different octaves to the harmonies, they all sound really strong and really crisp and clear. And you can enunciate them much better, I think, on a Nintendo than you can on like a Genesis or even, I think a Super Nintendo you can do it because the individual MIDI tracks are, you can do that with. Yeah. I just think on the Genesis, melody was not as strong. I'm not gonna say it wasn't strong, it, it wasn't as strong as it could be on like a Nintendo or Super Nintendo. Right, well on the NES with a wavetable synth, you also got a pure tone generator right. too. So it's yeah. not like oscillating like on an FM synth and it's not repeating a sample over and over again like it is on the SNES. So it does give you a much cleaner mm -hmm. tone if you use just a pure yeah. Pure what a pure note on the NES, <laughs> whatever you want to call it. Everyone is gonna hate this episode because we're getting super technical on Dude, music. I think people will like this episode because yeah, I think it's so? super technical. Right. Well, you'll <laughs> we'll leave it up to our audience to, to let us know. They'll they'll tell us. Sounds good to they'll me. They'll either yell at us with pitchforks and I stuff. love the technical stuff. I love pitchforks. <laughs> I thought that's what you're gonna say. <laughs> no, the technical stuff. So like eating my giant french fries. Yeah, yeah. Nom, nom, nom. Yeah, no, I, li I really like the technical stuff and talking about it. I just, uh, you know, we, we of course don't want to go over your heads, so if we are, bring us down to earth, let us know. Yeah, definitely. I mean, because this is a different styled episode, we'd yeah. love to hear what you guys think about this format. If you really enjoy these compare and contrast kind of episodes, let us know and we'll totally do more. If you want to hear more about sound hardware, if you want to hear us get more technical about music, also let us know and yeah. we'll add more of that to the show. We are here to serve you. Yes. Because we love our listeners. We do. So much. Really? I want to take them all to bed. That's weird. No, tuck them in, like child style. You should necessarily. take. You want to take them all to bed. Yeah. Well, that's, I, I, I that's, don't know. That's weird. Okay, bring them to bed. Tuck them in. Why do you want to tuck them in? They're not your kids. Because I love them. <laughs> With all of my heart. With all of my heart. All of my black, cold heart. <laughs> Why are you Irish all of a sudden? I don't know. Now, why are you Italian all Because I just am, all right? It's not good. Uh, <laughs> I don't under, I just go crazy sometimes. Oh boy. So this caffeine and this decaffeinated oh, coffee. That's gonna do it for us. Oh boy. I think we switched roles. I think you were the goofiest of the two of us. I'm in a good so. mood, man. I, I just, I don't know, feel amped up today. Yeah? Yeah. You gonna go run a mile after this? I might. Yeah. Actually, I'm getting a haircut after this. Oh man, that's like running Maybe a I'll mile. just go run around the hair salon. You should run around while they're trying to cut your hair. Start throwing hair everywhere yeah, on the floor, yeah. just pick it up and just eat rip it. your hair out. Crazy. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't wanna rip my hair out. I'll rip your hair out and then- I'm not that them, crazy. Make them put it back in. <laughs> go Sorry. back in! Can you reattach this? <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, so. That's gonna do it for us. You can check out this episode or other episodes on youtube.com forward slash dongled, where you can listen to all the Pixel Tunes radio that your heart desires. And by that, I mean all 30 previous episodes. Exactly. If you guys are still following us on the podcast page, Pixel Tunes or uh, facebook.com forward slash Pixel Tunes, also join us over at facebook.com slash groups slash Pixel Tunes. That is our Facebook group. We are much more active on that side of the Facebook That's right. thing that we do. Pages is basically gonna go away at some point. Yeah, we'll just keep so, posting the new episodes Yeah, we'll, there. we'll post new episodes and that'll pretty much be it. So you guys gotta get in that group Extra if you Extra content, haven't. sharing with friends and other yeah. listeners and other guests that we've had on the show also post there regularly as well. Best part about it is you get to post too. So if you like a really cool track, you wanna share it with us, you get to go right on that page and go, hey Mike and Ed, my name is Billy Bob and I really love this track and I'm gonna play it for you, here you go. And we'd love to hear it. Just like that. We'd love to hear your voice just like that. Totally. We are also <laughs> at Pixel Tunes Radio on the tweets. The tweeties. The tweets. Tweeteroonies. Follow us there as well. Also at Pixel Tunes Radio on Instagram. Post some pictures of games and stuff that we do. Everyday life stuff. Brushing teeth. Brushing teeth, combing hair, polishing our glasses. Murdering victims. Cutting our toenails. Being a bad dude. Killing dogs. <laughs> Dressing like a bad dude. bad about it afterwards. Do you want to go for Halloween as, as the bad dudes? It's the bad dudes. Yeah, we'll just both, it'll be the easiest costume. We'll it both would. just dress in Sweat different pants. sweatpants and wife beaters. <laughs> That'd be awesome. And then we just have to like every 15 minutes put our arms up and shout, I'm bad! I'm bad!
But like that. Speaking of which, on the NES, that vocal sample yeah. was it's amazing. Awful. Amazing. It's like like I'm bad. Like just like into the microphone as loud as you possibly can. Like <laughs> why would you even let that in your game? Uh, because it's amazing. It and sounds it's better in the arcade version. The, the best part is there's like a slight pause in the music. And so it, like, you'll, loads the sample. you'll hear this music and then it's loading the sample and it'll just be like, I'm bad. <laughs> <laughs> it just sounds so good. It's so cheesy. I love it. I love it. Incredible. Oh, man. So I'm going to go ahead and put some sweatpants and wife beat around, go lay around the house, maybe record some other M footage for the next episode that is already released. Sounds good. Yeah. I'm going to go. Yeah, I just Sega time traveled C there. Yeah, I'm going to go play the Sega CD version for. Earthworm Jim. Yeah. Find out what the extra content is. There you go. Or you could just look it up on the internet. Cheater. Sorry. Just saying. God. Oh. <sighs> YouTube is only for when you actually play the game. Then you go back through and see all the stuff you missed. Right. Okay. Bye. That's it for us. We'll see you in two weeks. Peace. <laughs>